which as you know occurs every second year of the Lyle Society. We're very sorry, of course, that we can't uh, meet in person. We're having a Lyle dinner with no dinner. So as we were saying in the our preparatory remarks, this is intellect without calories. Um, uh, so it's uh, it could be austere, but we've been having a good experience actually in the college with webinars, and I'm sure this will be uh, no exception. Just one word of how we're going to proceed. We have a number of speakers, as you know, but we're recording all the proceedings, including any questions and answers uh, there might be. So if you have something terribly indiscreet you're planning to say, you might want to save it for later. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Um, Amelia Cross, our alumni relations officer for getting it all together and in organizational terms also to thank um, uh, Shamita and our uh, Shamita, Connell and Karen, our three Earth Sciences Fellows uh, for the role that they played in getting this together. And of course, each of our speakers. Now, just by way of introduction, as many of you know, I'm not a neuroscientist or indeed a scientist of any sort. I'm a historian, but I've developed a little interest in Lyle as part of um, some research I've been doing on the reform of Oxford in the 19th century. And um, Exeter was one of the colleges that needed reform, according to Lyle, who became a, a kind of armchair expert on the deficiencies of what he saw as the unreformed universities, including Oxford. And he was a slightly ir irreverent alumnus of Oxford, um, particularly irreverent about what he saw as the deficiencies of my uh, predecessor, Rector Cole, in letters to his father. But nonetheless, he got a second class degree in classics, which given that he wasn't really interested in classics, was doing pretty well. And of course, famously, he attended Buckland's lectures and in many respects got a head start on his scientific uh, interests. And of course, he went on to be a truly great scientist um, and a, a worthy person to inspire um, this particular society because uh, Earth Sciences, I know I'm speaking to the converted, but Earth Sciences self-evidently is a very strong subject at Exeter. It has been for a long time, hence the distinguished alumni, some members of whom are speaking to us today, and it's certainly thriving in the present. Um, in terms of the research of our fellows and the uh, teaching and learning uh, of our students, undergraduates and postgraduates. So um, uh, to me, the Lyle dinner is one of the, the, the highlights of the cycle of Exeter occasions. And I'm delighted that we've been able to preserve it into the pandemic era. So thanks to everyone who got this occasion together. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Shamita, who's going to have the um, uh, pleasant task of introducing the various speakers. Okay, so, the, so thank you, Rick, for a very interesting anecdote about Lyle. Lapton, are you ready? Lap Hi, Shamita. Lap yes. No, I know. Are you ready, Lapting? I'm good. Fantastic. So the first speaker is Lapting Cheng, who graduated. I've forgotten when. I had sent an email about when he graduated. Who is working, who's connected to us just now from Hong Kong, which is why he's the first speaker, because it's in the middle of the night for him. So thank you, Lapting. So take it away, Lapting. Thanks, Shamita. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, midnight over here in Hong Kong. And um, Kono, Shamita, thanks for your time. Thanks for inviting me over. I mean, um, it's uh, one of the no carbon travel. I think everyone's grounded for, for good. And um, I'm glad to be um, speaking uh, to all of you, including current and ex students. Um, myself um, joined, um, uh, matriculated in uh, Exeter in 2004. So I joined, uh, uh, joined the college 2004 to 2008. Uh, my specialties has been um, doing the earthquake towards my fourth year project. Um, back then I was looking at um, Japanese earthquake source project, 
uh, source process uh, with Chamita. So after Exeter, I left, um, made a detour to business. I left um, England and um, went back to Hong Kong and joined a multi-conglomerate called Swire. The Swire is a big group that runs a um, big airline, a big property business, and um, most of the Coca-Cola production in the US uh, and China. So with their executive program, I've been there for 12 years already, and I've been um, rotating around different locations and roles um, throughout, the, throughout the time. So apart from Hong Kong, I've spent three years in the US, in Miami, and also two years in Beijing, uh, the capital of China. So all of which are different pro property projects at different spaces. Um, property projects that my company does are quite, quite, quite large. They are similar scale to um, what you have a uh, Westfield, uh, Century City or Westfield, Stratford, that's all. So right now I'm back in Hong Kong after a brief rotation around America and China. And I'm now currently heading up the um, property management um, business for the residential project here. Uh, my neighborhood is not that big. It's just uh, 61 residential towers with uh, 30,000 residents. And um, it's been a very interesting time because we've been leading through the, uh, this particular time through the political issues in Hong Kong, which started uh, a year ago. And um, when it wind down a bit, uh, 10 months ago, and then COVID-19 um, hit my territory. So I had to lead a team of 400 in uh, tackling all this uh, situation um, through some really interesting time. Um, my time at Exeter helped me to um, pick on this uh, SWI career. It's uh, interesting enough, I remember our first um, Lyo encounter was back in uh, 2006. And uh, 14 years ago, this weekend is was when I met with uh, Ed Nichol, who happened to be traveling uh, from Hong Kong to join Lyle dinner. Uh, back then, Ed was the director of one of the Swire businesses, and uh, I had the opportunity um, to met with him. And uh, from that point onwards, that's how uh, I I made connection with uh, with Swire. So do don't underestimate um, the the power of this um, alumni, our Exeter alumni connection. As you hear, I'm sure you can hear what I've been talking about. <laughs> and um, last but not least, um, advice for, for current students. I mean, um, the world is going through a very interesting time. Never been that um, uncertain, never been that um, crazy or around, be it politics, business, around, say, but I guess we as geologists or earth scientists, we have all been taught um, to work with incomplete data sets, to plan ahead, especially when we head out to the fields for field trips, be it whether you're stuck in the middle of Essen or you have missed the flight flying out to wherever in the middle of Mediterranean for a field trip. I think we're all um, well adept survival and changeability. I think um, using this skill, you can really take this forward to um, wherever you are and um, be able to make an impact um, to the world. Thank you, Labting, for an inspiring little speech. Before I continue and uh, turn the uh, mic over to others, anybody who has any questions, I want to tell you something you don't know about your own Fortnite thesis. I just wrote a section in the Encyclopedia of Geophysics and I used some of your unpublished figures from your fourth year project. So those pictures will be available for the next 50 years to the public. So congratulations on that wonderful stuff you did, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Please, anybody fe who feels like asking Lapting any questions, please go ahead. Hey Lapting, it's Ed, just saying hello. Hi Ed. <laughs> You've got to mention I was a geologist as well. <laughs> yes. I'm not sure if we've lost Ed. No, I'm still there. I had you know, I didn't have much else to say other than uh, okay. Hi, 
Any other questions for for Lapting? You can introduce you can introduce your family to us if, if they are there. They're all asleep, probably. Carl okay, has, has a question. Carl has a question. Yes. I was, was going to say so. So clearly, <clears throat> clearly within Spire, you've moved around quite a lot recently. Um, what was the most What was the most challenging of those postings, uh, or the most challenging project that you have to deal with? I think um, all of which are quite uh, challenging on its own. I think I think this current role right now I have is uh, is one of the most uh, challenging one. As uh, although you may say this is my hometown, but um, so this time I'm managing quite a big team. I uh, all the way from from uh, the property management uh, managers all the way down to security guards. I have a team of 400, and the backdrop is with um, social unrest on and COVID as well, which is something that we have never dealt with before. Although you can say um, we have some sort of um, business uh, continuity plan uh, planned before in place, but then in actual reality, it's actually a very different, very different idea. And it's basically every morning we are we are dealing with a very different situation. I guess the I think the Earth Science training um, did prep me well in this regard in terms of. Uh, Facing uncertainty, uh, and then with the crisis, yes. and the red when the red line comes through and say, "Hey, we we have had this many people have this sort of problem. How are we going to deal with it?" And we have to think straight on, like down on them our feet. I think I think our geologist prep, uh, training prepped me really well. Okay, pleased to, pleased to hear it. Do any of the students have any questions for Lapting? If not, then maybe we can move on. Rapting, thank you so much. Thanks, Amita. And the next person Sorry. is also from your class, who is Richard Walters, who is now a professor in Durham, and he is has a sore throat, so he will try to talk. So, Richard, take it away, and thank you, Lapting. Hi, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> right, so I'm going to try and talk. I texted Connell this morning. Uh, I couldn't speak at all, so apologies if I'm a bit squeaky. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is uh, this is our class photo of our year. That's me. That's Lapting. Uh, also in our year were Ben, Katie. Um, so it was actually our year who who first established Lao Society. Um, so I'm pleased it's still going strong this many years later. And Mrs. Paula Moffa Sanchez. She was our our college mother. She was in the year above. Um, so I wanted to share a bit about my background. So I came uh, before Oxford. I uh, lived in Weymouth. Uh, I did chemistry, maths, geography, geology at A level um, in a FE college. And I always actually thought I was probably going to do a chemistry degree. So when I came to Oxford to do earth sciences, I I I was, had a passing interest in seismology. And because Shamita actually was the only academic fellow. The only tutor in earth sciences at the time I came to Exeter but I still thought during my undergrad I was going to specialize in geochemistry um, that all changed with a Greece field trip in the third year which really blew my mind when I went on it and inspired me in the way that tectonics and earthquakes um, these processes were operating now but they'd shape the landscape over thousands tens of thousands of years um, and how you could really quantify these processes and understand the hazard that faced people. So then in my fourth year, I decided to do a research project with Phil England and Barry Parsons using a technique called INSAR, which is basically radar satellites. Um, they can measure the ground, you can investigate earthquakes with that. So I did that with, for my fourth year project. Um, and then actually, I enjoyed that so much, I decided to be a glutton for punishment, stick around working with Barry and Phil, um, but also at Exeter for another four years. And I did my PhD on the same general topic using satellite radar to study tectonics, um, lots of places around the world um, for another four years. So beyond that, I moved to Leeds in 2013 to do a postdoc to continue that work, really been looking at the global scale and trying to map seismic hazard using this te technique. I got married while I was in Leeds. Uh, shortly after that, I then got my first uh, permanent job 
in Durham. So I was a lecturer uh, there and now associate professor. Um, and uh, my family grew a little bit, so I now have two little girls as well. And I think what's quite interesting about this path is what you can see is, is actually quite a clear uh, trend in these data. And actually it's possible to extrapolate, I think, through these data and think about where I might be in a few years time. Um, so I think it's quite safe to say that I'm likely to be living in the North Sea uh, and have four more children if we extrapolate <laughs> through that trend. So just to get a taste of some of the stuff I do. Like I said, I'm interested in using this satellite radar to map seismic hazard at a larger scale. This is Turkey. The red colour is showing Anatolia moving out to the west at a, about uh, 20 centimetres, sorry, 20 millimetres per year, two centimetres per year. The change in colour is showing the hazard that is essentially building up on the north, the east Anatolian forts there. This is really exciting. We can do this at like, the tectonic plate, the global scale now. Um, I'm also very interested in seismic sequences at the moment. So these are where you have a network of faults and instead of um, these individual faults break, and sometimes all these faults uh, break together in a very big earthquake, but sometimes actually these faults, they break kind of piecemeal in a stuttering sequence over days, weeks, months. And so I'm interested in, I worked with Laura Gregory, um, who's also on this call, I think, um, on this sequence in Italy. But also I'm interested in, in general why uh, and where these, these sequences happen. Um, this is a PhD student of mine, Katie Burrows. We've been working together using radar data to map out landscape slides following large earthquakes. Um, so these are landslides following the big Nepal earthquake in 2015 and developing rapid de tools for mapping out these landslides for emergency response. Um, and, and finally, another PhD student of mine is uh, really doing some exciting work using machine learning to take large amounts He's got vast amounts of these radar images now and uh, and here there's some kind of hidden earthquake signals and she's developing methods to automatically separate out the noise and how that varies through time and the earthquakes. Um, so that's some cool work. Um, so yeah, so I, I was asked to give some advice. Well, academia is brilliant. Um, I, that's the only career I'm a, I'm a, uh, qualified to comment on. Um, academia gives you so many opportunities to do so much variety of things. Um, you know, looking at the Kobe fault, which is well preserved in Japan, uh, hunting for um, fault ruptures in California. Uh, this is me being a dog's body for, for Laura Gregory here, who I mentioned before in Italy, and helping her lug this laser scanner around on the Italian mountainsides or doing. GPS deployments out in the far where we have to move by camel and can get up and close to amazing volcanoes like this one, or even you know uh, working with the media and being on TV or writing articles on earthquakes for the newspapers. Um, but actually, of course, mostly what I do is sit on my computer still, uh, but that's fine. I find that truly exciting too because I'm a massive geek and I like coding um, and the problem solving that goes with that. Um, so. Academia is absolutely brilliant and you have all of these opportunities. And my key piece of advice is to take up those opportunities wherever they come and, and really make it your own if you follow that career. Also, it is very competitive. So what I advise is that you do it just for the love of it, for the love of the science and for the enjoyment. And actually that you always have a backup career even in mind. Um, I've always had a backup in my, pa in my back pocket um, the whole way through um, just in case I did, wasn't able to get a permanent position at the end of it all. And so I, I really do recommend actually doing it basically for the, for the love of it. Um, and you do have to work hard, that's true. But, you know, it's a myth that you have to be some form of, of genius. Um, hopefully I can be testament to that. Um, and, you, and you also don't have to be married to a job. You can balance your, your work and your life. Um, and and that's, you know, that works well. And something about most important contacts. A student in Durham actually just asked me about two days ago about setting up industry contacts and how to do that. And actually I said to him, well, the most important contacts are probably your peers. It's the people you meet. Oh, I missed the people you meet now. Um, so Paula Moffa Sanchez here. She works now. She's also an academic in Durham. She works about 100 meters down the corridor for me in Durham. There's uh, five members of staff, academic staff in Durham, who I all know from Oxford. Um, 
and even actually Richard Palin, who I believe started as an associate professor recently in Oxford. He was the very first person I ever met in Oxford at interview. And we went for a beer when we went up for interview. Um, so the contacts you make now, your peers around you, they are, are going to be important contacts throughout your career, no matter what career you go into. Um, I think my voice is just about to go, so thank you. Thank you, Richard, for giving us a little glimpse of your illustrious career. In fact, we now have a whole bunch of people from Exeter at Durham, isn't it? Besides Moffa, we've got Amy Gilligan, who's going to come on later. So... It's Aberdeen, but yes. Oh, Aberdeen, sorry, sorry. It's, 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 all, it's all the north. Stop north. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Amy. Does anyone have any uh, questions for Richard? He can manage one or two, I think. I've got my lem set, so we're good. I'm intrigued uh, to know what your backup career was. I had many. Um, I, I w was interested in media and science communication until I went and I did a, a, a media fellowship. I worked for The Times um, as a science journalist. Uh, and after that, I decided that I didn't really like it so much. Um, uh, so that we're going to put pay to that. Um, software engineering, actually, kind of some of some of the kind of a practical side of things I was thinking about and also risk. Uh, so another graduate from Exeter, um, Ben Fox. He went and worked for a major risk analysis uh, company in London. He now works or he was working for World Bank for a while. Um, I'm not sure if Ben's actually on this call, but I was really seriously thinking about that for a while as well. So, and who knows, maybe maybe one day I'll still I'll still do something else anyway. And Ben Fox lives in Bermuda now for those Is who are in Bermuda. OK, yeah. yeah. Any other questions? In that case, Richard, thank you for doing this with your problem throat. No, well, thank you for inviting me. So now we are going on to a very different kind of career. Next one is Essie Ishan. Essie, are you ready? Uh, hi, all. Yes, yes, I am. Hopefully, I'm sharing my screen with everybody at the moment. Is that right? Yeah. Can you see? Okay. So I'll just I'll just start. So hi everyone. It's really interesting seeing what people but are doing. We want to see your face. Oh, you can't see my face. Not yet. We just see Lyle Society event. Ah. I saw it. Don't worry, don't yeah. worry. Yeah. Awesome. It's fine. It's okay. Okay. I'll I'll come on at the end for questions. <laughs> okay. okay. So, um, so, uh, she, please go ahead. Thank you, Shamita. So I get, as Shamita said, I'm going to take you away from earth sciences too. So I matriculated in 2000 and while I was at Exeter, I specialised in seismology with a focus on kind of how human activity can affect seismic activity, such as explosions and or fluid injection kind of causing their own earthquake. So this is me. Uh, this is Exeter and earth sciences for me. This is the front page of Exxon in 2000 when I matriculated and here um, you see the ECOFISC, the Norwegian ECOFISC field that I did my fourth year project on. From there, to be honest, I loved my degree, but um, I think my main thought at that time, rightly or wrongly, was to get back to London, which was my beloved hometown, and find some work. And I still remember talking to Dr. Dath about my plans, and my lasting memory was her, of her kind of saying that perhaps it was too early for me to tie myself down to a desk and then going and printing me an application for a job maintaining seismic stations around the world. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> but having not listened to her, I um, thought about what I could do when I was in London. And being quite pragmatic, I sat down and wrote myself a list of the things that I liked to do. And I wrote myself a separate list of the things that I thought I was good at. And unsurprisingly, they certainly weren't the same thing. And I discovered, so this is thinking about what I was going to do. I discovered that I was a people person. I like to help people. And kind of I learned from earth sciences that I also love to solve problems, small ones, big ones, all sorts of problems. And it might be surprising, but maybe not. That led me to the law of all things. So 
I converted and trained at a top 10 law firm in London. And then early on in my career, I came in-house. And um, my career has seen me living in Hong Kong, and I've traveled to many places around the world to negotiating project finance deals. I mean, they're really interesting places like Seoul, Dubai, Washington, Tokyo, Paris, New York. I've kind of been to them all. But I kind of have to confess at this point that many trips just saw me sitting in a large and often underground conference room negotiating documentation. But it wasn't all just um, work, work, work. I managed to see quite a bit. And I think, you know, kind of um, doing that and freeing myself from my desk might have been what Dr. Das saw all those years ago. And it has meant that I've kept interested in my career all of these years. So today, I am the Director of Legal and Compliance at a government department called UK Export Finance. So you'll see that's our crest there. Um, the Exporting is Great campaign. It's across government, but we're kind of keyed into that finance purposes. Um, there is Liz Trust. Trust, she's our Secretary of State no doubt negotiating us a great trade deal with the Japanese. I, um, we provide financial support to enable and develop and grow exports. And so it's really topical at the moment and really needed and we've kind of never been busier. So we support exports from, uh, let's see, aircraft manufacturers and construction companies to design firms and high street retailers. And I manage the legal risks associated with small businesses, mega million, billion pound projects alike. And I've got a team that helps me to advise and negotiate those deals. So I said I'd moved quite far away from earth sciences, but actually part of me doesn't actually feel that far. Um, some of the projects I talked about on the screen is a project in Ghana we helped with. And many of the projects that I supported are oil and gas extraction projects and often offshore. And uh, especially uh, this deal in Ghana is really great because that's where my family's from. And so having sat in lights out on many visits in Ghana, this oil and gas extraction project in order to bring power or, or more reliable power to Ghana is definitely something that I could support. Um, but I also in those meetings felt pretty smug sitting in the technical meetings and listening to all these experts tell the financial people around me how oil is trapped and the complexities of extraction and the you know, kind of phenomenon of associated gas. And then I would have to go in and, and, and clarify with my colleagues because they hadn't quite understood. So really, though, in essence, earth sciences taught me how to handle evidence and see causation and patterns. I think from plate tectonic markers to mapping layers of sedimentary rock across large areas, um, maybe working through the evolution of subspecies. They're all skills that I am still using in my career right now. Legal issues are mostly just problems to solve and um, I need to ask the right questions and evaluate the answers proportionately in order to be able to give the right advice when I do. So we talked about kind of approach for a new career. So I mentor a few people. And I find that a really useful step when you're doing anything different, either at the beginning of your career, in the middle or near the end, is to sit down and kind of really admit to yourself what's important to you. Is it experience? Is it status? Is it money? Is it variety? Could be flexibility to do other things. Uh, maybe the feeling of constant progression and promotion. The point is it doesn't really matter what it is and you don't even need to tell anyone you just need to be honest with yourself and you can use that information to when you're making the decisions about your career so your priorities might change over time but that's okay but i just find that where you're not um keyed into this kind of information and it doesn't and your choices don't align with your priority you end up unhappy frustrated or disengaged after that, I would just say be open to new opportunities that present themselves um, and you might not have thought about them, but they could give you amazing experiences and a great path to work towards. And then just a little bit about me. So for me, I hadn't thought about working in the government department at all before a, a recruiter suggested it. I was all for the big city law firm. But actually, I can really say that my 11 years here have continued to be interesting. 
So variety was one of the things that were important to me, as well as flexibility to continue to teach in my Taekwondo club, which I do uh, three times a week. Um, and also we're crazy busy, but I have control over my time and how I do it and when I do it. Uh, I'm also really lucky to have the ability to work from home in this pandemic. Um, and I live in South East London, near my really big family. There's quite a lot more than um, shown here. And I have a choice of fabulous parks and woods within walking distance. So really, it's all pretty OK for me now. Uh, I think probably time is running away with me a little bit, but it's been really great talking to you and happy to take any questions. I'll stop sharing and then you can keep my face. Thank you, Essie, for inspiring our students to do new things. And does anybody have any question? None of the students want to ask her anything. They're being shy. Anyway, one thing I did get you to do is to travel around the world, isn't it? Which yes. is what I was yes. trying to get yes. you to do. <laughs> Because we were putting in the worldwide instrument system to study the international nuclear, you know, to to test that treaty that people were not breaking their their word on their treaty, and we were putting those instruments. And I wanted you to go all over the world, but you've gone over the all over the world anyway. Darling, Connell, any comments? I, I I loved it. I thought it was fascinating to to yeah. hear about your your thought process as you worked your way through uh, as well, because I think that's that's really important for people to be open to sort of new avenues and new opportunities uh, as they go. So yeah, in, in getting compliance though, I guess a lot of your time is spent checking commas and <laughs> semicolons and <laughs> <in> documents. <laughs> it, it used to, it used to. Now I have to deal with the knotty issues of whether Something is not necessarily illegal, but the legal risk that comes with them and the and the kind of financial crime risks that we're looking at, you know, bribery and corruption in, yeah. in, in the contracts that we support. So we're helping UK exporters get contracts abroad, but we have to make sure because we're a government department that those contracts are won and conducted properly. So that we kind of association with that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Now, people often ask me how I got to law from from you know geology, earth sciences, and so I've I've, I've told a number of people <laughs> about my thought process and how I got there. Thank you, Essie. Thanks, Essie. Any any other questions for Essie? Otherwise, we'll move on to the next one. Can I ask a question, Shamita? Yeah, of course, of course. Hey, um, thank you, Essie. That was a fantastic talk. Very very nice. Um, so. What was it like um, transitioning from a from a high powered law firm to uh, to government? <laughs> that, that's a good question. It, it was very interesting. So people often move from um, city law firms um, to an in house role, maybe at a bank or at a, a at a company, where at least the aims of the company are generally to make money. And but moving from that world into government, where the aims are not necessarily to make money, but to complete um, complete aims, and our aim is to support UK exports. It was completely different. So yes, you get a lot of you got a lot of support in private practice, and not so much in government. But actually, the thinking that you can do something not because it makes money, but because that's what we're here to do. It's a complete shift for me. It's a complete shift for me, but good at the end of the day. <laughs> thanks. Okay, thanks, Essie. We'll move on. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure seeing you. Okay, next is Andrew Hurd from Chicago. Andrew, are you there? Uh, yeah, hello. I'm going to okay. try to share my screen. Hopefully, it'll, it'll work. Can everybody see a PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Okay, see. great. So um, I suppose I'm probably the, the most recent graduate from Exeter who's spoken so far today. This is a picture of the, the Lyle Society class of 2016 um, at, the, at the school's dinner at the end of our fourth year. 
I'm sporting a pretty horrible blonde moustache, which you can't even see in the picture. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me. I'm, I'm from Bampton in East Devon, uh, just to the edge of Exmoor. Um, I went to Exeter College from 2012 to 2016 um, and specialised in geochemistry, uh, which was quite strange for me because coming into university, I didn't really have much of a formal chemistry background, even at A-level. Um, but I, I got into geochemistry and did a, a master's degree uh, advised by Chris Ballantyne, who I believe is now the head of department uh, um, uh, uh, in the earth science department there. And uh, since 2016, I've been doing my PhD at the University of Chicago. Um, and I'm hopefully entering my last year of that and planning to graduate next summer. So the research I did at U Chicago, the University of Chicago, uh, was in Chris Ballantyne's Noble Gas Geochemistry Lab. In practice, I spent most of the time working very closely with uh, Ollie War, his postdoc, who's now in uh, Toronto. Um, and whilst I was there, I learned uh, how to use a, a gas source mass spectrometry line. So this is a, an instrument where you, you basically introduce a, a sample gas and you do lots of opening and closing valves and freezing down different parts of the of the, the sort of this network of tubes to separate out the noble gases that you're interested in and then feed them into a mass spectrometer to measure their isotope ratios. And uh, the samples I was working on came from some uh, very deep sourced groundwaters from South Africa and it was part of a, a large collaborative effort which is ongoing to understand uh, where these fluids come from and how long they stay around in Earth's crust. Um, so on the left, you can see here that this is a this is a, a popular science book written by uh, T. C. Onstott, who's one of the sort of the leading people in this field of deep groundwaters. But it's got a nice picture here, which I just wanted to highlight. You can see deep down in these mines, basically the the water is sort of flowing out of cracks in the in um, in the rocks three kilometers below the Earth's surface in some of these deep gold mines in South Africa. And these are the, the samples that I was working on uh, when, I, when I got to Chris's lab. So the interesting thing about these samples is that the, the waters in them uh, have an isotope composition which suggests that they are ancient rainwaters. They fall on this thing called the, the meteoric water line, which suggests that the, the waters that we're looking at were originally uh, uh, rained down on the Earth's surface and gradually percolated down to these great depths in these uh, deep fractures. And the work I did in Chris's lab was to look at the accumulation of uh, radiogenic noble gases uh, trapped in these fluids, which can tell us about how long that they've uh, spent below Earth's surface. And the exciting thing we, we found in one of these fluid samples is that it had so much radiogenic noble gas in it that it had probably resided in the crust for, for millions of years. And so we might have actually been looking at the sort of the oldest recorded fossil rainwaters that anyone's ever discovered. Um, so after I, I got my, my degree at Oxford, I headed on to the University of Chicago. Um, there was a few reasons why I chose Chicago. Um, it's a historic institution for geochemistry, particularly isotope geochemistry, which is what I specialize in. Um, I preferred the idea of the five-year uh, American PhD program. Gives you a little bit more time to sort of develop as a scientist before you're thrown out into the real world. Um, I actually came across papers by my future PhD advisor, who is Nicola Dofas, this uh, tall chap in the, the yellow gilet here. Um, I, I read papers by him when I was writing my fourth year thesis, which is how I, I found out about him. And last, of course, just having a look at the photo here of the University of Chicago, obviously it felt like home because uh, John Rockefeller essentially stole the architecture from the University of Oxford when he funded the construction of this university. So what do I do now? I, I still work in an isotope geochemistry lab. I now work on metal isotope geochemistry and uh, I make measurements on a, a plasma source mass spectrometer, which is this big ugly grey box you can see on the right here. Um, and in particular, the two things I've focused on doing is using the geochemical record of iron in ancient sedimentary rocks to learn about the history of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere and oceans. 
and sort of as a side project thing that I also dabble in, I do some experimental and some modeling work uh, targeting chemical processes on Mars and trying to understand how the atmosphere and uh, uh, sort of surface conditions on Mars have evolved since uh, over the last few billions of years as well. Just a little bit of focus on my, my most recent concluded project. We were interested in understanding on a global scale, how did the iron cycle interact? So iron in the oceans, how did it interact with uh, oxygen and uh, the rise of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere uh, prior to uh, the rise of um, oxygen to high levels in the atmosphere around 2.5 billion years ago. So I worked on some samples that were 2.5 to 2.6 billions of years old. Um, and what we were particularly interested in were the interactions between uh, the burial of FES2, which is iron sulfide or pyrite, and uh, the amount of iron being buried in uh, iron oxides. So these uh, materials, we find them today, iron oxide sediments, for example, um, in big banded iron formations, they're called. They're a source of a lot of our iron ore that we, we use today. There's a lot of them in South Africa, in Australia, in, a, in the northern parts of the, of the North American continent. And pyrite, we sort of, it, we find it everywhere um, where we have black, orga black organic rich uh, shale rocks. Um, and in order to form these uh, minerals in the ancient oceans, we needed iron coming out of black smokers on the seafloor, and we also needed sulfur coming out of uh, volcanoes on land and also beneath the oceans. And some work that I did recently was to develop a new high precision iron isotope measurement technique where we were able to essentially tease out different types of chemical processes which have impacted the, uh, the geochemical record of pyrite. And what we were able to do is uh, infer from measurements of a single pyrite grain what was going on in the oceans at that time with regards to how much iron was being deposited as iron oxides and how much was being deposited as pyrite. And this is a very important question for um, thinking about Earth before the rise of oxygen in the atmosphere, because the burial of iron oxides acts as a sort of effective sponge that sucks oxygen out of the oceans and deposits it in sediments. Whereas when we bury iron instead in pyrite through a, a complex network of reactions, uh, we can actually uh, infer that the burial of pyrite would indirectly lead to a source of oxygen to the environment. And we were able to show that based on measurements of some of the pyrites we were looking at from the Archean Eon, um, the relative burial rates of iron oxide and um, iron sulfide in pyrite in the samples we were looking at suggest that there could have been some transient sources of oxygen provided uh, indirectly by the global iron cycle before oxygen started rising in the atmosphere. So just to give a few uh, tips or comments, I suppose, on what I would give as advice to other people thinking about pursuing PhDs, because I'm still quite close to this process. Um, what I would say is to start, if you're interested in doing a PhD, start thinking about it early and start reaching out to professors whose work you come across uh, that excites you. Um, there's nothing to be uh, lost by shooting an email to a professor. They either will respond and give you an answer and often it will be uh, an enthusiastic response and if you don't get a response at all then there's sort of no harm done there um if you get the opportunity to visit graduate schools absolutely make sure you do um you can't always get a good feel for a place without actually being there and um visiting various institutions when i was thinking about phds definitely changed my minds about the, the ones that I preferred and which one I wanted to go to the most. Um, it can seem a bit daunting going into a PhD, but I think it's important to realize you don't need to have a fully formed idea for a project when you go in. You just want a, a sense of what interests you. And I think it's important to know why you do want to do a PhD because uh, at least three years and it's upwards of five in the USA, um, it's a long time to spend working very hard on something if you're not really passionate about it. And finally, I, I just suggest, and it's nice to see some current Exodus students or 
recently graduate, graduated Exodus students are already doing this. Um, reach out to um, current graduate students in your network or in labs you're interested in whenever you get the opportunity, opportunity to. We're, we're always willing to answer questions and uh, chat to our future peers and we can often give you a, the most honest and accurate impression of what different labs and different PhD experiences are like. So with that, I will uh, happily take any questions if there's time for it. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. And before I let you go to the questions, I want to mention to everybody that the work he just spoke about has just appeared in Science. And I have sent the link to that paper to the development office, and it will be put on the um, alumni website in the next few weeks. And if anybody wants to read it earlier, please contact me. And another paper, which um, she's probably on the list here looking at us, Louise Biddle, who gave the uh, Exeter the Lyle talk last year about her work in Antarctica, that she gave us a preview last year. That work has now been published and it was reported in the New York Times in mid-September. And I have also sent that um, link to the uh, development office for putting on the website. So these two papers, if anybody's interested, will shortly be available. But if anybody wants it ahead of time, please tell me and I'll send you the link. So thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Andrew? Rick, you have some question for Andrew? Uh, uh, one question would be interesting. I mean, I moved in the other direction of doing my graduate work, i.e. from the US to the UK. Um, do, do you find that um, earth sciences in the uh, Chicago is, is like earth sciences in, in Oxford, all one great field of science, or is it an American accent to your um, graduate student experience? Uh, I would say the, the big difference you see, and it's probably something that affects the undergraduates more, is that this ability to sort of construct your degree from many sections and majoring in something rather than entering with the intention of getting a single degree means that the, the geology education you get is probably less complete in the USA. You sort of, you build up your geology major from individual classes and there's no unifying curriculum there. I think in terms of uh, graduate studies and academia in the USA, science uh, science principles are sort of, they're, they're uniform everywhere. So uh, I wouldn't say the style of doing science is too different. The one thing I would say that um, the US has an advantage in my field is the, the huge amount of funding that comes from NASA thinking about these, these problems of uh, planetary science and things going on on the early Earth. Um, uh, the NASA grant programs are, are very useful in that regard and I think probably influence more of that kind of science being done in the USA. Thank you, that's helpful. Any other questions, comments? Otherwise, thank you very, very much, Andrew. I did want to mention that first photo you showed from the school's dinner. Wanted to mention there were five people there three of who are doing their PhDs in the United States. And a fourth one who's already got a PhD from Edinburgh. Oh, who was that? Uh, Rachel. Oh, fantastic. OK, so the, thank you, Andrew. So the final uh, speaker is Amy Gilligan from Aberdeen. Is Amy there? Yes, Amy is there. Hi, Amy. Okay, Hello. Amy, I'm uh, going to let, Amy is a seismologist, so I'll let her talk about her work. Thank you, Amy. Amy, you can go ahead. What happened? Uh, 
can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. And can you see my yes. screen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, so yes, I'm a lecturer in geophysics at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, um, and I was at uh, Exeter College between 2006 and 2010. So a bit of background. Um, I was quite young when I discovered geology as an option. Um, from a visit to a gold mine in North Wales. Prior to that, I'd had aspirations of being a photographic journalist and an explorer, but um, combined with wanting to climb mountains, geology seemed a good um, career. So I started studying earth sciences at Exeter College in 2006. Um, it was, I guess it was a relatively unusual year in that I was the only one in the college at the time, uh, in my year, um, studying earth sciences, but I think that's, I guess, one of the things I'd, a piece of advice I'd like to pass on for, for current students is that it gave me the opportunity to, or had to mix with students studying other subjects. Um, and I think there's a lot that you can learn and take from people that are in diverse fields um, from the one that you might be working in or studying in. And I think that you can learn a lot um, from that. So um, I think the other thing is that the earth science degree in Oxford gives you a really broad range of earth sciences. And I think that's something that's, again, very valuable when you're if you might go into sort of more narrow, more narrow fields to sort of have that background um, and experience. And I think um, Shamita and Connell were the tutors um, while I was there. And I think having that the, the mix of both of them was a, for me was a really valuable um, experience as, as I've gone on um, in my career in academia. So um, one of the one of the highlights is the mapping project, um, and I really enjoyed traveling, developing um, independent field work, um, and getting outside and doing doing geology. I was also fortunate um, while I was at Exeter to get the North America Travel Scholarship, where I spent six weeks traveling around North America, um, meeting with alumni and seeing some amazing sites. The generosity of people um, while on this was um, amazing. Um, yeah, in the in just a moment, the, Amy. Can you put your? We only we see your title thing. We can't see your face. Um. That's okay. Yeah. I think Chamita. Nice. She's. We can nice. see her at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Um, so in this picture of the tent, um, in the background there is Mount Lyle, which I'd hoped to climb, but there was fresh snow, um, which I didn't think was that that safe at the at the time. Um, but the North America Travel Scholarship, I think, um, is another thing, a piece of advice, I guess, is to take opportunities like this that um, you have as a student. Just a um, moment, Amy, are you showing pictures of this, whatever you were going to climb? Because we didn't see, I could not see it. Now we see it. Thank you. Okay, I'll just do it like this then. Um, sorry, technology is... Um, so, yes, Mount Lyle. Um, and I think that's one of the things as, as students to take opportunities like this to travel. Um, you have the t having time to be able to do this is a fantastic resource. And I think particularly in Oxford, you get many opportunities um, that you don't necessarily have later in, in your in your lives. Um, so um, I did my fourth year project with um, John Woodhouse. Now it's not working. Sorry about this. My laptop. Um, with John Woodhouse, and this really got me into um, seismology. And so what I do now is use seismology to look inside um, of the Earth. So using different parts of the records that we get from seismometers, um, so using the body waves, the P and the S waves, and the surface waves, with a variety of techniques to build up pictures of what's going on inside of the Earth. So in 2010, I moved to Cambridge to do a PhD with Keith Priestley and Steve Raker. Um, they're focusing on um, looking at the structure um, of the crust and the upper mantle in Central Asia. So we developed a new surface wave tomography model um, for, for the lithosphere in, in this region and so had some focus studies, particularly in West Tibet and the Tian Shan. And so this combined my interest in seismology and understanding processes in the Earth with understanding how mountain ranges um, form. In 2014, I moved to Imperial College London, working with Ian Basto and his, his group um, there. And there I got a lot of experience in managing and, and installing and uninstalling seismometers in a network that we had um, in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick to study 
um, which was part of a bigger project called QM3, which was looking at processes going from the Archean, Superior, um, Craton, all the way through the Grenville origin to the Appalachians. And then in 2016, I moved to Scotland. So my partner, um, Dominic, who'd done a, um, a degree at St. Cat's in Oxford, who had met, met in Oxford, um, had got a job working at a research institute in, in Dundee. Um, and so I moved to Scotland and got a job at the University of Aberdeen. Um, and this obviously was uh, a great opportunity to climb mountains and things like this. So I finished climbing my Monroes in 2018. This summer, we ran a, a round of Glen Nevis um, 18 mountains in 24 hours that was good fun and I think um, I think as Ezzy and um, uh, Rich have said that I think there is making sure that you have a job and a career that allows you to do things that you enjoy is really really important. Um, so my research in Aberdeen is really focused as uh, they've been so focused at the moment on um, looking at North Borneo so here is the island of Borneo and I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about the work that we've been doing there. So in, in the north of Borneo, in the Malaysian state of Sabah. This is really interesting from a tectonic point of view in that it's somewhere where we've had two different subduction systems. So one here from the northwest and one here from the southeast that have stopped fairly recently in geological terms. So we're interested in what happens when subduction stops, what are the tectonic processes that go on. It's also a place where we see um, earthquakes. So in 2015, there was a magnitude six earthquake, um, which caused a lot of landslides, damage to, to rivers and, and, and therefore um, agriculture um, in the region and, and lots of infrastructure damage. So one of the things we also wanted to do is try and understand and better um, understand the hazards and mitigate against them from seismic um, observations. So this is just showing a geological map. It's quite complicated. But actually, a lot of this that's, that's below the surface isn't really well constrained. We don't know what's going on there. And so we could use seismology to try and uh, understand this. But unfortunately, before 2017, there was only um, this little triangle show where there were seismometers, and there's not very many. However, in a project, um, which is a joint project between the University of Cambridge and so Nick Rawlinson's group there, the University of Aberdeen and um, the University of Malaysia, Sabah, um, we in store between 2018 and January this year, um, a network of 46 um, broadband seismometers um, across, across North Borneo. So um, I think the building on skills I developed um, in fieldwork through my undergraduate and, and traveling around opportunities that was given to me in at Exeter College um, helps sort of uh, coordinate the logistics of installing this, this network. So trying to fit everything into, into the vehicles, driving on some interesting roads, as you can, can see here. This is um, Tim Greenfield, who's um, at Cambridge, getting the car stuck in the mud. Um, we also, as well as using roads to get around, we had a few stations inst installed on tropical islands. Um, we also trekked through the jungle in the Maliar Basin to um, install one um, in the centre of the basin. I think, um, realising my five-year-old um, aspirations to um, explore, be an explorer. Uh, and then we also have one on Mount Kinabalu, which is a 4,000 metre high um, granite mountain in the middle of um, Sabah, um, which also achieved a career goal of being paid to climb, climb a mountain. Um, so what have we found so far? So we only got the final lot of data in um, January, so I think this is maybe a bit blurry, but we've been looking at how thick is the crust? And there's some intriguing observations, for example, that beneath Mount Kinabalo, so this 4,000 metre high mountain, um, the crust isn't very thick. Whereas beneath the sedimentary basins, like the Malia Basin, it's quite, it's quite um, thick there. We've also developed um, velocity models. So this is shear velocities, so S wave velocities. And one of the things you can see here on this cross section, which cuts, cuts through here, um, these slow velocities, which we think is the um, underfrosting material here, and then these fast velocities, which are possibly abducted um, periodic, periodic material there. The other thing we've been able to do, because we've got more seismometers and better velocity models, is put some new constraints on the earthquakes that are happening um, in this region. This is some work in progress I'm going to be presenting at the AGU meeting in a few weeks. Um, where this is just for a couple, the two years that we had all of our stations out there, we've got, I think, in the south, um, 
the southeast of Sabah, we've recorded at least over 100 earthquakes when the existing catalogues from the Malaysian Meteorological Service only had two in this time period. So this is really valuable information for being able to understand the hazards um, that are present in this, this region, as well as the tectonic processes um, that are going on. So um, obviously, please feel free to ask any questions. I just want to put a small call out for, with my hat on as the British Geophysical Association's um, outreach officer, is that we currently have a fund that's open for applications. Um, so if you have any sort of geophysics outreach type activities um, that you'd like funding for, please do apply by the 30th of November and the information's on the BGA um, website. Okay, let's see if I can stop here. Thank you very much, Amy. I actually understood your talk, so thank you. <laughs> I did have a question, very quick question before you turn it over. I turn it over. You know, I saw that you had some stations underwater. So they're on mm -hmm. islands. Yeah, um, on islands, okay. But um, the Cambridge group, in collaboration with Chinese colleagues, have um, put a network of OBSs that were out for about okay. a year between between Sabah and Sulawesi um, okay. in Indonesia. So that's a really valuable data source for understanding the te the wider tectonics um, in this region. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Amy? None of the students asked any questions. Yes, Professor Trin. Go ahead, Rick. Okay, well, my, my question, I, I spent many years living and working in a university in Scotland, Glasgow in, in particular. How, how, uh, how have you found it uh, living in Scotland at a time of so much political ferment? Um, it's an interesting, I guess, the, it's interesting, particularly with COVID in that, for example, Aberdeen University is possibly one of the only universities in the UK currently that isn't under some kind of lockdown um, in that the sort of central belt in Scotland is under more restrictions and I guess in England um, and Wales and, so, and Northern Ireland is. I think Aberdeen is a very international university, so I have colleagues from all over the world. And I think that... Um, and it feels very international city, I think, because of the um, the outlook towards the sort of North Sea and the oil and gas particularly does bring in a lot of people to work from in Aberdeen from all over the world. Um, I, I really I, I enjoy Scotland as a place to live very much. I think it's it's interesting to sort of contrast different political strategies, particularly around COVID that have been been followed um, in some instances. But. Um, I think there's things that we can can learn from each other, and I think there, and I think I don't. I, it's, it's a place I very much enjoy living. Uh, I think, and I'm yes, so did I. <laughs> we keep stay living here. And, Thank you. And, and it has the benefit of topography. Yes, <laughs> um, definitely. Um, so I'm going to turn uh, the mic over to Connell for a wrap up. So Connell, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So, so when um, when I guess COVID struck and we realised that the Lyle dinner probably wouldn't be able to go ahead, we thought it was very important to try and find a way of touching base with you all and, and catching up with you all, even if it's in a an electronic format. And and we thought actually it'd be great to invite some alumni to come and say something. And we deliberately wanted to have a mix. Um, and you can. You can decide for yourselves if, if we've got the mix right or whether we had too many academics and not enough other people. Um, but I would like to thank all, all of the contributors. So I'd like to thank um, Amy and Andrew and Essie and Lap Ting and Richard in alphabetical order, of course, um, for their contributions. Um, and I would also like to, to sort of say, make a little note, actually, I think it, because what we wanted to do for the undergrads was to give them the idea that there are actually a variety of different avenues that are open to you and there are a variety of different things that you can do. And, and I suspect if, if you talk to any of our alumni, probably the thing they've ended up doing is not the thing they thought they would be doing when they started their undergraduate degrees. You know, they may have had ideas about, well, I'm all, I might want to do research or I might want to do this or I might want to do that. Um, 
but I think you know what we hope is that um, our degree opens and a lot of avenues for you to go down and, and you know things to explore not just in the physical world but also in in the world of work. Um, and I thought I would close by actually noting it's particularly apt that we had Essie speaking to us because of course Essie sort of reversed Charles Lyell's career trajectory because Charles Lyell did a degree in classics but then he became a lawyer. And after he spent seven years as a lawyer, he, he, he uh, graduated in, in, as a lawyer in 1820. Um, but by 1827, he had retired from doing law and had become a geologist. And as, as he managed to reverse that course, so <laughs> there, I guess there's a nice sort of historical closing of the loop there as he went from doing geology to, to becoming a lawyer. So um, I think at this stage, normally if we had the dinner, of course, we would have been able to raise a a toast to the Lyle Society. Um, we can't do that this year, but I would still like us to sort of raise a, I guess, a virtual toast at least. Uh, well, well done, Andrew. <laughs> I, I, I'm on coffee. <laughs> but anyway, I think we'll, we'll have a virtual toast and, and it's a virtual toast to the Lyle Society and to all the, the members past and present of Earth Sciences at Exeter. And, and thank you all very much for attending on, on well, what, what is here a rather wet and miserable Saturday afternoon. But we'd like to thank Andrew for joining us from points west of here. And we'd especially like to la thank Lap Ting, who's joined us from the, the far side of midnight, I think it is now, in, um, in Hong Kong. But thank you all very much for joining us. Um, I hope you all learned something. And uh, I have to say, I've been really enjoyed and been inspired by, by hearing of all your uh, activities and, and career trajectories. And we hope that we'll be able to welcome you all in person to a real dinner next year. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, thank everyone. You. Really enjoyed that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, that's brilliant. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Right. Oh, well. nice. I, I, I had a question for Essie, if she's still on. Yeah, I'm still here. Yes. When you went to negotiate with these oil industry people and 